I doing? Well, drywall tape and texture. Why am I making a video about it? Well, I kind of wanted to document my little build series and this is part of it. So why am I doing it, you ask? The drywall? Well, I kind of have to. I don't have to, but... Basically what happened was I called a couple of uh, drywall contractors out. Uh, most told me they're too busy doing track homes. And the only way they would do this project is when they had some availability. Or they could squeeze it in for the right price. The right price is obviously a lot. I didn't actually get a price. Most weren't even that interested in taking the job. Which left me with, uh, I don't want to call them second, second rate contractors, but contractors that do everything with drywall on the side. So they're not drywall pros necessarily, they know how to do it, but they also fix sprinklers. Make sense? I actually had no intentions of doing the drywall myself. The plan was to save some money by hanging the drywall, which I did, and call a guy that does tape and texture to come do this. Uh, one problem I instantly ran into is who did the drywall? Now at first I didn't want to tell anybody that I did it because I wanted an on honest opinion of how it came out, how good of a job or how bad of a job I did. They can insult me all they want. I can take it. I don't mind. But the reason they were so curious of who wanted or who did drywall, because they want the impression I got was it was a pretty good install. And if the guy that installed the drywall, why isn't he finishing the drywall? So a lot of them didn't believe that I did it on my own. They still, even after I told them that I did. Well, I mean, do you had a guy come out here and start it for you then, or? Reason being, in Arizona, if you're not a licensed contractor, the law isn't on your side. So if they did an absolute junk job as an unlicensed contractor, I wouldn't have to pay that. And they know this. So they are very cautious over who they take work from. So when they saw my drywall job, they assumed that a, a professional did it. I didn't do it. I was lying to them. They wanted a little more money up front. Or quite a bit, actually. Uh, one go guy we had, he said, okay, I'll do it. The best price. 4500 cash up front. And that was never going to happen. Especially with an unlicensed contract. So I offered, okay, well, I'll, I'll pay the, I'll buy all the materials and I'll pay you as you go. He said, well, no, because i got to pay my employees up front, so that doesn't work for me either. Now, I've never worked a job where I got paid up front. I sure wasn't going to hire anybody to get paid up front either. Uh, two guys that work for a drywall company, a drywall finishing company, who said they could do it in their off time. So, cool. Two young kids, you know early 20s, if not still in the teens. Probably get a decent price out of them. They, uh, I don't know what they did for that company. So they could be laborers mixing drywall mud, or they could be finishers, you know, I don't know. If I asked, they may or may not have been honest with me anyway. Uh, they came out originally, nice enough people. But they measured everything. Every square inch of this place got measured. Now, looking at the walls here, you can see this. You can eyeball that and know it's about a foot. You can look at the bottom sheet, know that's a full sheet, look at the top sheet, see it's a full sheet. So four feet, four feet, one in the middle, nine foot ceiling. You don't need a tape measure for that. These guys did. And not only that, they measured every ceiling in every room. A complete waste of time. We measured the window openings, you know, on the windowsill, how deep the windows are. They measured the air vents, how many were in each room. 
you would think to subtract because you're not doing that eight square inches on that bin. They probably added to it. So they came back with a price of $8,900 and a span of five weeks to do it. Now, five weeks I wouldn't, wouldn't mind. The $8,900 I did. That place is twice the size of this place and costs five grand a day. Oh, if that was weekends, I'd be fine with it, but they also said that's 40 hours for five weeks. So I was assuming they were using a little two inch putty knife to do the place, but I didn't like the price anyway, because it's almost twice as much for half the size and five times as much time. Eh, didn't like it. Oh, and we didn't get into the cash up front, but I'm sure they would have wanted it. So here I am doing the tape and texture myself. You may be asking yourself, well, Brandon, you, you do a poor attempt at outboard repair videos. What authority do you have on doing drywall? Well, honestly, none. Much like every other how-to video on the internet. However, yeah, I did these rooms and I think they came out okay. All right, so let's get started. Depending on how familiar you are with drywall, it's gonna depend on how much this makes sense. Well, although I can make it make sense. Okay, so we have though, as I mentioned previously, the one foot board and a four foot board, nine foot ceilings. Now, Canada and some parts of the US, you can order or get, or they sell, I don't know. Um, five foot wide drywall. So instead of it being a four by eight, it would be a five by eight sheet of drywall, probably get longer lengths too. Or you can get a 54 inch, a 54 inch would have been perfect because you can put the four and a half foot down here, the four and a half foot up top, or 54 inch, and you have your nine foot walls, everything goes smooth. Where I am, you cannot get 54 inch or five foot wide drywall anywhere. Can't even special order it. So we do what this is. That's called a belly band. Now, according to uh, United States Gypsum or USG, this should be avoided at all costs. However, according to the contractors on the internet who talk about drywall via YouTube or forums, this is the way to go. Reason being is when you're standing here at eye level, you can't profile down the wall to see the hump. Your, that, that seam is not at eye level, but nearly at eye level. So if you do do a really bad job of taping and texturing, you won't be able to see that seam. Makes sense. The other advantage is you're working here, you know, at arm level. If you put that seam down on the ground here, you'd be down on your knees working on that seam. You don't want to do that, especially as a contractor. You're going to be doing this for years. You, you don't want to be doing that. So it makes sense to put it in the middle. The problem with that is you wind up with this screwed up joint. If you're familiar with drywall, the long side is tapered on the ends. So you can put your tape in your joint compound inside of the taper, sand it all nice and smooth, and you'll never know there's a joint there. The other end, um, like right here, the short end, the four foot side, it doesn't taper. So when they join together, called a uh, called a butt. This is commonly referred to as a flat. This is a butt joint. By adding this seam in here, the way we did it, it creates the whole building as a butt joint. Everything is screwy. So to give you an idea, you can see there's there's a gap there. That's the well, I don't know if you can actually hold on. All right, this is a flat. So you can see that gap. Cool. Now we come on down. We have the the flat of the lower sheet, but the butt, which we created from the top, which gives you this, this kind of half joint. It sucks. So what I was doing over there was filling in this area so that I have a flat surface that I can apply my tape and joint compound to, aka mud. The reason I'm filling in the flat on the top, sometimes I'm gonna have a full flat like here, thing down here or sometimes I'm gonna have the you know a flat on top flat on the bottom flat everywhere so rather than screwing around trying to remember which is which just fill in the whole stupid things so they're all the same kind of well not flat but they're all basically a butt joint so that's what I have to do pre-fill everything if I had to do it differently that joint wouldn't be there I would put all of those down the bottom and just deal with it. Rather than spending $9,000 to pay somebody to do this for me, 
I went ahead and spent $1,600 on automated, semi-automated, and hand tools to do this place myself. And that's what I'm going to be getting into. All the different tools I'm using, how I do it, or how I did it, and yeah. All right, this is, this is what we in the drywall biz refer to as hot mud. It's not an air dry, it's a chemical dry. With that, said, with that said, it's not actually accurate. This doesn't take 45 minutes and that doesn't take 90 minutes. Different minerals in your water are going to cause different drying times. That's first of all. So let's go with the 45. Example, it dries in about 30 minutes in your bucket, about four hours on the wall. Just kind of how it goes. 90, a little more working time, but similar results. A good example of this is this. You can see how it's a little whiter up here and a little browner up here. Uh, this is about three hours old. Uh, this, this joint was done a few days ago. It's good and dry and ready. Now, this says easy sand, but it's anything but. That stuff does not sand easily. I don't care what that bag says. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and finish filling in the joints of this building uh, pretty much everywhere, uh, along with any large gaps like right there at the center of the ceiling. Use the hot mud to fill it all in, and then come back and we'll do the taping. Pre-fill all of the cracks of the butt splices and on the corners where whoever framed this place did a lousy job. It's, it's actually not the framing, it's actually the uh, floor, but anyway. That's it for day one. Prep is done. Tape Buddy drywall taping tool. You put your mud into that little slot right here, paper back here, and you pull it out and put some mud on you. So I decided to give it a try. Uh, Amazon reviews, uh, hit or miss, most, most people like it. The occasional, this thing is junk. Um, We'll go through the uh, problems with that in a second. You have two, this little tab, one side is thicker than the other. That allows you to apply more mud or less mud to the tape as it goes. I was using it on the more mud, but I had a lot of, uh, a lot of wipe down problems. So I'm gonna be using it on the less mud side, which is the thicker side, into here. And if there's a problem, I'll switch it back, but I think I know what I'm doing now, so I think I won't have any issues. And that's basically how that assembles. Now, a lot of people on the internet, aka Amazon reviews, complain that there's no way to attach it because you need a significant amount of force to be able to pull the paper through here and it could kind of slide. So a lot of people got to hold it with their hand and pull with the other and it's kind of a nightmare. I saw one comment who said, I wish it attached to a five gallon bucket or something, which was a kind of a funny comment because it, it does. It has these little slots on the bottom, which conveniently, sit right into a bucket. Gives it a little bit of, little bit of holding power, so I don't, I don't know what that was about. However, I found that little bit of holding power wasn't quite enough. So what I did was I put two holes in the back, and you'll see why in a second. Let's load it up full of paper first. I found uh, not doing this and trying to do it after. Really sucks. Gotta make sure it's going in the right way. So we feed it in. Fed it in through here, now just out the front. Now, those holes really come in handy because I just screw it to the table. Not even very far, just enough to hold it. I suppose you could probably clamp it. But why bother when you can just screw it? Now it also came with a little bucket scoop, which I thought was kind of gimmicky at first. However, it really works well. It really comes in handy. I'm gonna cut this off so I don't have that label. Discard the paper, and that thing's nearly ready to go. Now, different areas of the country are gonna have different types of the compound that you can buy. Um, locally, we have all-purpose, uh, so quit, so quit, so quit, whatever this is, and plus three, as well as a uh, ultralight. Didn't get any ultralight, don't plan on using it. Uh, what this is, is a heavyweight, a midweight, and a lightweight. When I first started using the soy quit stuff here, I actually really liked it until I tried the plus three, and then I no longer use this. Um, 
for what we're doing here, we need for taping. We need to use all purpose. It has more adhes adhesive properties to it, so it really makes that paper stick. These, and eh, not so much. So we can't use those. We need to use the all purpose or heavyweight joint compound for taping. And that's what we'll be doing. Now, if you've watched other drywalls videos first, you know you need to mix this stuff previously. So we're gonna need some buckets, a drill, and a mixer. All right, so got my other edge set up. Now, as you pull this stuff, you're gonna start to get mud on it. However, if you just leave it, you're gonna start to get little blisters or little hollow spots. So what I do is I use the included knife to kind of agitate it as I go, and it really helps it just completely get covered. All right, so there's four feet. I'm gonna go just back just a pinch. So I'll get my taping knife now and go put it on the wall. Now I'll do it again. Now for the ceiling. There are three splices on every run and there is a total of 10 runs. So 30 butt splices in the ceiling. Uh, that's, that's gonna be fun. Yeah, and this is, this is the ugliest part of the ceiling too. A contractor would use stilts or scaffolding to go up there. I'm not sure how they do it with scaffolding, considering you know you need a you can only do 40 feet at a time because you'd have to get down and move it every now and then. Maybe they have a helper pushing it along as they go. Either way, it doesn't sound like the best option. Either way, uh, stilts those work fine if you're used to using them. If not, you're probably gonna fall, break your wrist, and go to the ER. I bought some, walked around the living room for a while, and realized that I didn't I didn't like that at all. Uh, so what I did instead was I have those two benches that I was using to install the drywall. I went ahead and just made, a, made eight more of them for a total of 10, which means I can go a total of 40 feet, which is conveniently the width of the building. So that's what I'm gonna be using to get back and forth along the ceiling. Okay, it's hard to tell, but I'm in a corner now, and thank you, baby. Uh, that gap looks huge. Uh, I don't know why, because I couldn't get that penny from there. Anyway, checking the corners, making sure that we don't have any screws sticking out. Do they need to be fixed? That's right. Looks like I only have one. So. Start at the corner, work your way down. Make sure you don't have any problems. I'll do that for all of the, uh, well, I'll do that for all the corners and then uh, I'll do the ceiling later. Well, now that the cheap stuff is done, let's go ahead and talk corner tools. Just so we know the lingo here. A drywaller wouldn't call this a corner. They would call this an angle. A corner is where all of the angles come together, forming a corner. Now, I would call that a three-way and this a corner, but you know that's just the lingo they prefer to go with. However, with that said, I'm pretty sure the uh, manufacturer of these tools even call them corner tools, so I don't know. First thing we need after we get the tape on the wall is what's called a corner roller. Which again is funny because if those are called angles, not corners, why is this called a corner roller? What's that? Attaches to a uh, 
drywall it. tool, handle, and rolls the tape onto the corner. Now, one thing you need to understand about drywall tools is they have a different thread than painter's tools. So you can't use a painter's handle on that. You need to get a uh, drywall tool. For that, I have this, which is a also a Columbia fixed length handle. The handle also came with this little ball adapter to go to another type of tool. Now, originally, I had one handle. Well, you'll see why in a second. I bought a second handle to make life easy. So I have the adapter on the second handle, the extendable handle, and the fixed handle I use for the roller. Now, we have the ball adapter is used in this part, which is called a Columbia corner flusher or direct flusher. This is a two and a half inch. That'll do the first pass. Then we need to do a second pass with a larger size, so I have a three inch corner flusher. Uh, these have a little hole in the back where you could inject compound and would come out through the front. As this goes down the wall, it would apply the compound for you. With that said, I wish I knew that these didn't work at all when I bought it because I could have saved a few bucks buying one without the little addition. So there's that. So our first step is roller. Second step is flushing the paper onto the wall with the smaller direct flusher. Then we're gonna come back with this compound applicator, which is gonna put the mud on the wall for us using this compound tube. This is just a big suction tube that sucks up mud. This is the cheaper of the variety of platinum drywall tools. After that's done, we then come back with a larger direct flusher and finish everything off. So we're not gonna need the three inch, we're not gonna need the applicator, we're only gonna need the roller, the smaller direct flusher, and two handles. All right, I got about 50 feet of tape pulled out of my bucket here. Bucket is set down in the corner where I wanna work. And I'm gonna grab that, my step stool, and I'm gonna pull it all the way up to the top up there. Again, that gap is smaller than it looks like on the camera. So I'm folding my tape. Now what I'm gonna do here is something that no other drywall in the world would ever consider doing. Yeah, sorry about the shaky, we're both on the ladder. I'm gonna cut my tape to a 45 to make that upper corner, or three-way corner, look just a pinch bit. So I'm going all the way up as far as I can with it. And I'm going to keep the tape, the center of the crease of the tape right into the crease of the drywall, wherever the crack is, and I'll work my way down. Okay, I'm going to get the corner roller. I'm going to start at the top since I put that crease in there. And all I'm going to do is run it back and forth up and down the wall. Start with light pressure and I'll work my way down. And the more passes I make, the harder I'll push. And our tape is embedded nearly perfectly. Uh, at a glance, I don't see any folds or tears, rips, or any problems, so it's it's good. However, see all this mud coming off the uh, side here? That's where the direct flusher comes in. Now, despite how you're supposed to do this, I'm going to start at the uh, top because I don't want to tear the corner out and work my way down. Same way, start with light pressure, gradually increase the more passes I make. Everything's taped, all the corners are done, corner bead is installed. Um, I actually had uh, Grams do that for me, so that's all done. So this is the first coat completely done. 
Well, originally I wasn't that good at doing this by hand, so I got some automated tools to kind of help me along. This is uh, going to start getting expensive now, if you thought the corner tools were expensive. I have some, I don't want to say lower end, because the company would never say they were lower end, but less costly than some. Uh, drywall compound boxes, they call them mud boxes. Again, I don't like calling it mud, it just sounds too weird to me, so compound boxes, but mud boxes. We have a 7 inch, 10 inch, and a 12 inch. And naturally, they need a handle. So, I have a handle. This is a 42 or 48 inch, whatever it comes with. Uh, I was reading the reviews on Amazon about these and people are saying how it's dumb, you need a, a special handle. I think they just bought it expecting to use a broomstick. Uh, this is the handle. It has this little hand stopper thing, so you stop it wherever you want to hold it, but I just hold it down here anyway, so it just flops around and smacks me in the knuckle. Um, this attaches up there. The other end is a brake, so you squeeze this, and it no longer lets that turn. See what I mean? So anyway, that's that. The first pass in the ceiling is going to be on all the flats with the 7-inch. Then I'm going to switch over to the 12-inch and do all of the, uh, the butts. Next day when it's dry, I'm going to go over the flats again on the ceiling with the 10-inch. Then I'll no longer need the 7 and the 10, and then finish all the butts off with the 12. All right, let's get this handle attached, and then I'll put the other uh, two-way handle slides on the top. Attaches like so, and tightens down. Okay, we have a setting on the back. Well, first see this blade, see this door? When you push this onto the wall, this door goes in, right? This is full of your compound, which then gets forced out of this hole. This blade on the back then kind of shapes it for you. So if you look at it, it's got a slight crown to it. That gives you a nice hump on the uh, compound as you go. And the higher the number on the setting on the back, the less of a hump. Uh, where it is right now, just loose, they consider that wide open. Um, I found a one or a two works good on the flats, at least for the first coat. So that's where I'm going to be running. I'll go set these aside for right now. Now to fill this thing, there are three ways, one of which is a joke, second which is probably a joke. Third is the probably preferred option, which is to use a little pump that goes on your compound bucket and pumps in through this hole. The problem with that pump is like 500 bucks and I didn't want to pay 500 bucks for it. The second option, which was my first thought, was to use the old open it up, fill it with a putty knife. That, that is a joke. Don't even consider that. That will take forever and you can't get enough in there. So what I devised was using my compound tube here, which I already had for the corners. Put in a bucket of mud, you suck up compound, and you push it in through there. Worked quite well, let me show you. Uh, the mud I'm gonna be using is this plus three. It is much easier to push through the box blade there, and uh, it's easier to sand, and it weighs less. The all-purpose I tried using first, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't push through that box very well. Uh, tried the soy quet, worked fine. Tried the plus three, worked fine. I didn't notice the difference between the two, but the plus three definitely sands easier. So, plus three it is. All right, got a little bit left in here. So, the fuller the bucket is, the easier this is. This bucket is pretty empty, so it's not just let me put it in there and suck it up. First time you fill it, it's going to take more than the next couple of times. There are a lot of little hidden cavities inside of there that I'll need to fill. So all I do is I balance it on my table there, and it's it's pretty held on because of the little tabs. Hold it pretty well. Put the end of the ball right into the hole. I just squeeze them in there. I'll do it on this side so you can get a better idea of what's happening. 
So it's filling, I think. And as it comes, starts coming out, I just kind of move it down. And it's nice and full, ready to go. Well, that took a little over seven minutes, it looks like. So, I've got 10 of these, nine of these to do, let's just say 10. So I've got about an hour and some change to do all this, not bad. If you notice, I also did the uh, screws I can reach. I do that as I go, just so I don't get lazy and not do it when I come back. Also, I wiped off quite a bit of mud, so I'm gonna run it on a two, see if I get better results. Time to run the top and bottom passes over the belly band here in the center. If you notice over on this left wall over here, I already did it. This is the last wall I have left. Um, if you notice that outlet in the middle, you may be asking yourself, well, what do you mean about that outlet? Well, let me show you. Now I'm trying to be as professional as possible here. So a professional would just cover the whole thing with mud, wires, box and all, and let it you know, electrician flake it out. So I'm gonna be doing the same thing. Just take a pass right over the box. That's how the pros do it. Nah, I'm just kidding. I have an old sanding sponge. I'm gonna uh, give this a try. I have been wedging paper inside of these with little mixed results, I guess you could say. It keeps the wires clean, but mud kind of puddles and falls out. So I'm gonna see if I can use this to just make a clear pass over it. So we'll see how it goes. Well, I uh, had some troubles there in the middle. That happens when you have two uneven surfaces of drywall you're trying to patch. Now, they are the same level, but what's not is the taper right here from that sheet versus these two, because that silly belly band, that's why I did that pre-fill. I got it in there, it just took a couple of passes. So, that's basically all there is to it. Um, let me show you kind of what it does. Now this doesn't look very straight, and that's, well, because I'm not that good at it. So if you remember when I did this, I took a knife and wiped it down. That made the mud pretty, pretty flat on the wall. But I can't wipe down this because I need that crown. So I ran the wheel kind of on the closer to the top of the flat here, of the flat pass, versus this. This created a slight hump. That hump basically starts right there. So when I come by and sand this when it's dry, It'll eliminate that hump, and I should have a nice transition the whole length of the board here. It's, it's a little funky. What I, what I originally did was ran a hump here, so no wiping, then a hump on the bottom half, no wiping, a hump on the top with no wiping, came back, did two more passes down the middle, let it dry, and then a third pass to bump to get all the humps back together. That was a lot of work and a lot of sanding. It was not fun, but it, it gave great results. Uh, this I experimented with. I uh, got the idea of a guy off a, a drywall forum. Uh, it actually works quite well. Just a pinch of sanding. You can't go too much because then you've gone too deep, but just a pinch of sanding, you have a perfect transition the whole length and only three passes, not six like I was doing. So it works pretty well. So when it's dry, I'll come back with the uh, 12 inch and run a the final pass over the butt splice. Again, no wiping because I need the hump from there all the way down, kind of in the middle. And when I sand it everything, sand everything, it should kind of blend everything together. Good morning. We are here on day four, I believe. Now in the video, these are pretty hard to tell what I'm looking at, but basically you have the joint that I created coming in here to the corner on both sides intersecting. Honestly, it looks like you already sanded this, so this is a bad example. There we go. See this booger? I'll worry about that when the corners are dry, but see right here and right here? That's where the box starts and then goes out. So all I really need to do is sand those off, touch up the corners, you know, the tops and the bottoms where they end and start, and then I can do the corners. So, Pretty easy. All you really got to do is 
come in here as a little sanding sponge. Smooth and flat. And that's, that's really all they need. Now, I don't think a drywaller, a pro, would actually do that. I think they would do the corners, do the top, and then you they have that booger, and then they would just feather it into there rather than taking the corner out, you know. So the joint goes into the corner. Corner doesn't flow into the joint usually, if that, if that makes sense. So that's, that's really all I got to do. It's pretty easy. As easy as it is, there, there is a lot of them. So on each end wall, we have one there there and yeah, I guess not there well there 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 so yeah you can see there's a lot of them to do so uh, I'll get started Now, because I don't want to keep moving these tables back and forth, I'm going to go ahead and start the next process now. I'm going to put the, the uh, top coat on all of what I've just done. So I'm going to mix up some mud, get the compound tube, get the applicator, the direct flusher, and a handle, putty knife and a pan, and I'll do what I've sanded so far. Okay, I have the three inch direct flusher, the direct flusher adapter, the compound applicator, compound corner applicator, uh, the fixed length pole, the reason I'm not using adjustable is because this is just a better pole, as well as the compound tube. I made a pass with the box here, let it dry, made a pass here and here. So what that did, passing it over that way, it created kind of a hard edge here and a hard edge here. Now, we also have a little bit of a rough edge down here. I think that's just an experience of using the box. So I just need to sand that down real quick and then sand the edge here, the edge here, and then another quick sand up top. That's all I really need to do. The same goes for the little splices I did. Um, sand the edge here, here, here. It's basically, to, you know, the whole square. It doesn't need much. And by far the worst edge, which is probably the easiest to sand, is the edge made from the corner tool. Now this is nice and nice and flat right there, but we have that hard edge. Uh, that is purely an experience of not knowing how much mud the uh, applicator is going to put on versus how much the direct flusher needs. I'm okay with that edge, it's pretty easy to sand off. So, yeah, it's it's still worth doing. By worth doing, I mean using the tools, because these these edges, they, they are, they're great. I mean, you have a lot of sanding, but otherwise they're fine. Uh, I've already done the front wall, I'm working on this wall, back wall, and garage door wall isn't gonna need much. 
And now it's just the uh, the screws. That's it's pretty easy. Takes a few seconds. Well, back wall is done. Uh, to get up there, as you can tell, I put the benches in front of the wall. So then I just walk around up there and stay in the corners. Uh, I have done three walls. One more to go. Should be done about four. Hopefully I get the ceiling done too. I'm moving a little slower today. Been out this a while. Well, a week later and all the drywall taping is done. I have some boxes of ultra lightweight for the texturing and a bunch of PVA primer for the uh, primering. Quick walk around here. Uh, ceiling, walls, everything is all sanded. Screws, all nine yards. Everything is pretty much ready to go. A lot of work, but well worth it. Uh, we'll see how it comes out when it's primered. Should be fine. As you can see, I put down some of this red paper, mask off the uh, walls, kind of. I should probably move that tape. Picked up a Graco Magnum X7 airless sprayer for this to make life easy. Yeah, this is much easier than me doing it inside. Ah, just like that, drywall is done. Now painting, yeah, that leaves something to be desired. You can, yeah, let's just ignore that though. Uh, if you notice, electricians came. I have outlets now. Uh, waiting for the sub panel here to get wired and the uh, water heater thing to get wired too. <sighs> a lot of work, so here's what I did. I did the closet first as kind of uh, to see if I could do it. Then did this little uh, food closet. Um, that came out a little better. Um, I did some testing on the, the walls to see the best way to fill in that belly band on that one. So just kind of another test room. And then I scaled up a little bit in here in the laundry room. And by the time I was in the laundry room, I was like, okay, I can, I can do this. This isn't that hard. By nine foot ceilings. So my racking would fit. That is the only reason. Not for that, I probably would have gone eight feet. Well, I, I got some junk everywhere. Summertime is uh, upon us. I gotta start working on outboards again. Ordered garage doors. Uh, it's probably gonna be at least two months before I get garage doors. Uh, the, uh, this coronavirus thing has really kind of put a damper on a lot, of, a lot of common everyday things like a garage door. You're not really getting them right now. Uh, doors I ordered from a local company because those are a few months away too. Local company, they could get them to me in two weeks, so I'll be putting those in when they get here. And my dad built me this little broom holder to hold up all of the uh, drywall tools that I bought. Uh, this is where the air compressor will go, so this will just kind of hang out behind the air compressor. I don't know, I, I guess it kind of acts as a little shrine for me, like these are all the special tools I bought to build this place. They're just gonna, they're just gonna sit here. I might sell them eventually, just cause I'm not gonna need them. But for now, the it's a good place for them. All right, everybody. I'll see y'all next time.